wanted to find a way to open this weekend of celebrations um, with a conversation with someone whom we found inspiring, which is really kind of the, the idea behind um, the new wave to really showcase talent, um, writers, creators, um, musicians who are making that change with the work that they do, people who are bold, who are being innovative as well in the work that they do. So um, as we, we strove to find someone who fit that bill and, and looked at some of the work being done over the past few years, um, we, we found um, that um, this creator um, really um, has made some bold moves and choices um, that have paid off and that have brought us some uh, incredible new entertainment, um, thoughtful, um, historical, so many things. So uh, please help me in welcoming our opening conversation, um, Stephen Canals. Hi, everybody. Good evening. It is so bright up here. So Stephen Canals is the co-creator of Pose, um, which I'm sure many of you, how many of you have already, I hopefully you've already seen it. Yeah, it's a fantastic show. If you haven't, you will definitely be seeing it after um, after this conversation. And and I think you know really. And the idea for this show, he's the originator. He's it's a co-creator along with Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk. But we're going to talk about sort of your roots, and we'll get to the point of creating Pose because I think you know as you watch the show, there's so many elements to it that seem personal and that seem really infused with the, the, that spirit of wanting to make change in the industry, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. So. You know, to start, can you talk about your roots as a storyteller? Um, I know that, you know, you were raised in the Bronx and that you started off in some community workshops and filmmaking and the process of transitioning from that to kind of more formal structure of, of screenwriting. Um, well, as you mentioned, I grew up in the Bronx. This was in the 1980s. And if you know anything about New York in the 80s, we had as a city stepped out of the heroin epidemic of the 70s and then promptly stepped foot into the crack epidemic, um, which was eviscerating my community as I grew up in, in housing projects in the Bronx. Um, you know, I started off as a consumer of film and television though. You know, I'm a cinephile and never really considered being a content creator because there were no models, you know, growing up as a young, poor Afro-Latin kid in the Bronx, like there was no one to look at and say, that is the person who I want to be like um, when it comes to creating content. Um, so I, I came to film, I suppose, late in that um, I was 15 years old. I was a sophomore in high school. This was in the early 90s. Um, you know, we the crack epidemic has sort of ended, um, and then gang violence emerged um, in my South Bronx neighborhood. And so a group of um, classmates and I decided that we were going to highlight that experience through an after-school program that was launched in my high school called Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. And through this program, we had the opportunity to work on a documentary short, which was funded by HBO Family, which I don't even know that HBO Family exists anymore, but at that point, it was a nascent network. Um, and so we spent seven months um, learning about film and learning about structure and editing, and we went out into the community and we interviewed our, our contemporaries and classmates and individuals who were impacted by this gang violence that was happening in our community. Um, and a week before we completed the edit of our piece, one of my classmates, Ava, who was an, a producer on this documentary, was shot and killed. And so we went from highlighting an experience to, at 15 years old, having the experience. Um, and that moment, the combination of, of creating content, crafting a, a documentary short, along with Ava's death is really what launched me into the career and the storyteller that I am today. Because I, I think up until that point, I always saw myself, as I said, A, as a consumer, but B, I think I always looked at content as being entertainment. You know, even if there was catharsis, even if there, were, there was some enlightenment that was happening, um, I never really thought about content as being 
um, an opportunity for real education as well until that moment. So was that a film that you were able to show to other people in the community once it was done? Did you have a, a showcase for it? And did that also serve to really you know, galvanize you in terms of you know, your, your passion for this kind of storytelling? We did have a showcase for it. You know, it, I think it's interesting. My, so I went to Stevenson High School in the Bronx, which no longer exists. Like my high school is now, has been shut down. Um, anyone who's familiar with the New York education system, um, my high school was on something called the Sir List for a number of years. Um, and so there weren't a ton of resources, monetary or otherwise, that were pulled into, into our campus. And so I don't know that anyone really paid attention to what we had created. Um, again, I, I remember there was a showcase and that was funded by HBO and we got to show it to a bunch of people. But, you know, I think the, the biggest takeaway from the doc for me was just that I knew that I wanted to be a storyteller, that I wanted to spend the rest of my life hopefully lifting up the lives and the voices of marginalized people who often aren't provided a platform to do so. Well, certainly one of the things, I mean, I think with independent film and independent storytelling, you often those creators want to tell those kinds of stories, but the industry, we live in Los Angeles and even in New York, the industry isn't always ready. Um, no. You know, at what, for you, when you saw that, I'm sure as you were, you know, strove to tell these stories and perhaps were facing some rejection, why, how, what kept you continuing, you know, what kept you, enab what enabled you to continue to write despite that? Well, not even facing some rejection, facing a ton of rejection. Um, I mean, here's the thing. It's, you know, we live in LA and Hollywood, Hollywood in air quotes, uh, is a very risk averse uh, industry. And so to, and, and there was no precedent for a show like Pose, right? So on one end, I understand why, you know, I was met with so much resistance and why there were a plethora of no's before finally hearing the most important yes. You know, I was going to ask next, sort of, and maybe it'll sort of circle back to there, that the root then of the specific story around Pose, the world, because it really, you really are world building in a way for those unfamiliar with this, the house ball scene, but also that community and building out the stories of these characters, um, building their own families. So what was at the root of, of that story that, that came from perhaps for some people you knew, but then also from imagination as you well? You just jogged my memory. <laughs> and now I remember what See, I was going to say that before. Would there it is. It came back to me. Um, I, <clears throat> I spent 10 years working in higher education as a college administrator prior to moving to Los Angeles to pursue film and TV full time. And what I was taught on the very first day working on my graduate degree in student affairs was as a college administrator, any foot, or excuse me, any campus that you step foot on, you must assess the landscape. So identify where there are gaps in programs, in resources, in policies, et cetera. And then you use your, your knowledge, your platform to inform the crafting of programs, policies, et cetera, that will then fill in those gaps. And so when I moved to Los Angeles, that was something that was critically important to me as a, as a content creator. Um, so back in 2000, and this was now, we we're coming out of 2013, stepping into 2014, I did an assessment of the television landscape. And at that time, we were seeing this glut of straight, white, male, cisgendered anti-heroes. So it was your, your Mad Men's and your Breaking Bads. And, you know, those are, are great shows, but I don't see myself or my story or the story of my community reflected in those shows. Um, and so in asking myself, who aren't we seeing? What gaps are there right now in the television landscape? Um, that is where the desire to then put Pose on the page and then try to go out there and get it sold came from. And what was that, back to that spark for that specific story? Because um, it is a very specific story for you personally, um, you know, our 
as a deal of roots and dance. There's certainly the dance element, a huge part of that in terms of the house ball. Is that was that a, a part of? I know you mentioned you love flash dance. <laughs> I do. I do love flash dance. Um, love bad eighty cinema. Um, I. So I worked on my undergrad degree in cinema at Binghamton University, which is one of the few uh, film programs in the country that is rooted solely in experimental video. Um, so, you know, I spent my undergrad experience watching films, experimental video by Stan Brakhage and Maya Darren, and, you know, I was in a program that shunned beginnings, middles, and ends, and so, uh, I, I say that to say that the semester that I was introduced to Paris's Burning by a visiting professor, it was like a breath of fresh air because, you know, for several reasons. I think one is that, it, you know, I could wrap my brain around what Jenny Livingston had created. You know, I, I wasn't watching, and don't get me wrong, I, I mean, I love Stan Brakhage and, and Maya Darren, and, and there are a lot of experimental filmmakers who I, I revere, but um, it didn't require as much work. <laughs> um, so I loved Paris is Burning. Uh, and, you know, at the time, I wasn't out. I was still stepping into my queerness um, and hadn't really seen any representation up until that point of queer or trans black or Latin people on screen. My parents grew up in Harlem, and the Harlem balls that are highlighted in Jenny Livingston's documentary happened right around the corner from my parents grew up, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And so I was just blown away by what I was seeing. I was seeing all of these resilient and intrepid black and, and brown people living their authentic truth. And that was just, it was so, it was very inspiring to me especially as someone who grew up in New York in the 80s, to see them being so resilient and to see this community exist, and it was just so full of love and support. Um, and so that was very inspiring to me. And so A, it inspired me to come out. Um, and then B, I just remember thinking, very vividly remember walking back to my dorm room and thinking that would make a really wonderful television show. Never thought that I would be the person to create it, I remember thinking, I'd watch that one day. Um, and so cut to, this was in 2004, 10 years later, I'm now sitting in a pilot writing class at UCLA and I'm doing my assessment of the TV landscape. And it's like, how has that story not been told yet? Um, and why are we still not seeing black and brown queer and trans people occupy space on television? Um, and so that really was the inspiration and the impetus for for writing it. Well, and you create a lot of space for that community, both on screen, but then also off screen, behind the scenes. Um, can you talk a bit the, about the collaborations that, you know, the way in which you built a writer's room with, you know, Janet Mock and Our Lady J that it really reflects the stories that you're telling? Because oftentimes, in television shows that the writers' rooms don't reflect <laughs> necessarily um, the stories that you're seeing on screen. So can you talk about, because I think that's really an important part of what you do as well and about cultural change making is really insisting on that authenticity um, in a writer's room and behind the scenes of projects. Well, I think it starts with the individuals who are the gatekeepers recognizing that they hold a lot of power. Um, you know, and so in the case of Pose, um, I have the, the good fortune of working with a prolific TV producer in Ryan Murphy, who admittedly is a cisgendered white man. Um, and so the very first conversation that we ever had when we discussed collaborating on this project was around the importance of creating seats at the table so that the folks who actually hold the identities that we're gonna be highlighting in our show occupy space in that room. Um, and that it would extend beyond just the writer's room, that we would have queer and trans people and black and Latin people um, not only writing, but producing and directing and serving as consultants, that we would have you know, black and Latin and queer and trans people in 
you know, every department, you know, in the hair and makeup and in our costuming. Um, and so what, what, what I think is so wonderful is that A, Ryan didn't balk at any of that, and B, that we have a really supportive network in FX who, you know, their, their motto is that they're fearless. And so they were, I think, ultimately because they, they trust Ryan, um, but they were willing to take a chance, if you will. A chance in air quotes because the reality is that this is this is our life and this is the life of real people who exist in the world and so you know I think we need to sort of change our our um, perspective when it comes to telling stories about historically marginalized communities you know like our lives are not risky so stop you know treating us that way when it comes to creating content. And, you know, in the, in the content, I have to say, you know, in so many of the, the scenes, the, the tenderness that you show um, between couples and the romance, and, you know, pray tell is back and, and, and enables himself to, to get close to someone, the beautiful arcs that you create for, um, for Electra Abundance or for, or for Blanca. Can, can you talk about how important that was as you, or was there, did you really think about crafting those, I mean, obviously you thought about crafting those tender moments, but the fact that there was that, that absence of them, um, you, you don't see, or starting to see more of it, but I think that that's a really unique and remarkable thing that there are these beautiful, you know, romantic moments um, amidst as well some, you know, a lot of pain and rejection, and we'll get to talking about that as well. I mean, you show many facets of life um, for those women and, um, and men, and it's, it's challenging, but again, those moments really stick out, or they're saying that the scene when they go to, um, they go to, to the home and, and pray tell and Blanca sing, and there's kind of a musical number, and um, really beautiful. I'm always character-centered, right? And I think the characters, this is gonna. This is very writerly for me to say, but you know the writers, or excuse me, the the characters. They speak to you, so they they inform what their narrative is going to be. Um, beyond that, though, you know we are three dimensional human beings. You know, and I think when it comes to representation, specifically if we're talking about the trans community. Um, you know, trans people are so much more than their bodies and they're so much more than their traumas. And when it comes to uh, representation in film and television, more often than not, they're only ever a plot line. You know, it's, it, you know, for decades, there's actually a, a filmmaker, um, Sam Fader, who's working on a documentary that's pr being produced by Laverne Cox called Disclosure. That's all about the history of trans people in, in cinema. Um, so check that out when it's released. But, you know, I think that historically for trans people, they've often been the body in the gutter, right? And, and that death then marks the journey, the beginning of a journey for more often than not some cis male cop, you know, to go solve the crime. And... Uh, you know, I think what we really wanted to do was show a, a fully three-dimensional human being, you know, where being trans or being a woman or being black was just one facet of what makes this human who they are. Which character did you sort of imagine first or, you know, or form first or come to you first? So the first character that came to me was Damon. This was going back to 2004. Um, primarily because at the time, as I mentioned, like I, I hadn't come out yet and I hadn't come out to my parents. And, you know, I had so much internalized homophobia that I was still battling and, and certainly was worried about how my friends and family would react. Um, so Damon was the first character and, and his narrative really didn't change in terms of what I initially... Um, developed versus what you see on the screen. You know, his being kicked out of his home. Um, and, and then I didn't come back to the story, like I said, until 2014 when I moved here. And the anchor for that original pilot that I wrote was always the relationship between Damon and Blanca. 
um, who serves as a surrogate mother to him. And so those were really the first two characters, and then the world just kind of grew from there. Well, and then you have a character like, you know, Electra Abundance, who is so big, <laughs> not the Damon is small, but was, was in any way, was she based on any, any characters or anyone? That, that She's you know? based on Ryan Murphy, no. Um, <laughs> which is kind of serious and kind of a joke. Um, but he would admit that himself. I'm not being shady. Um, he, because I think that's his favorite character. It's funny because we all have characters in, our, our writer's room is very small. There's only five of us in the room, but I think each of us has a character that we feel deeply connected to. Um, and so, you know, even if we're not necessarily writing a particular episode, like that's the character that you track throughout the season, just as like a checks and balances. Um, and so, uh, Ryan is, is Electra. He loves Electra. <laughs> he does. And he comes up with some really good lines for her. Um, yeah. The room would say that I'm Blanca. You're Blanca? Oh. Yeah. It and transitioned from, like, that's the character that I track to suddenly everyone was like, you just are her. Like, you are Blanca. You're taking care of everyone. and I try to be a mother hen. Yeah. Yeah. Like, come into my large coat. I mean, you know. Yeah. That's, that's nice. I think it's the educator in me. Mm. Or the former educator in me that I... And how did the how did the script go from being you know this a script that you were writing you know as part of a class or you know inspired in this this writing class to a script to getting in front of Ryan Murphy who you know at that time was was quite prolific as a and successful. Um, I mean, it's a, a long and serendipitous journey, but I, you know the short and concise version is that I. I'm fortunate to have a really strong team behind me supporting me and supporting my career. And um, my manager, is one of whom is here, was really wonderful about sending my material to everyone um, in the industry to create fans, fans of me, fans of my voice. Um, and so uh, my, my manager, Allard, he, he'd sent one of my pilots to Sherry Marsh, who's an executive producer on Pose. Um, and she and I had this meeting and we just, we really hit it off. And that so rarely happens in this, in the business where you meet someone and you sort of go beyond just the work. You know, we talked about life and we talked about love. And, um, and so anyway, at the end of that meeting, she said, I, I really want us to find something to work on together. Um, and it was one of the rare instances where she hadn't read Pose. She'd read another pilot of mine, and so I, I told her about Pose, and she was like, I want to read that. And that was on a Friday, and Monday morning, she came back and reached out to my team and said, I want to take this pilot out. It just so happens, because the universe conspires for greatness, that Ryan Murphy was working to acquire the rights to Paris is Burning. And so the week that Sherry and I went out to pitch Pose formally to all of these uh, studios and and networks, um, Ryan bought Paris is Burning, and then through the grapevine of Hollywood, he heard, you know, there's someone out there that has a show about the ballroom community, oh, wow. and so he he actually reached out to us, which was really incredible, and said, I want to read that pilot, I want to meet with you, I want to hear that pitch, <laughs> and I want to say to Ryan's credit, because here's the thing, is like at that point, I only had one credit under my belt. You know, I was what the industry calls a baby writer. And so the fact of the matter is that he didn't need me. You know, like he did not have to collaborate with me. Um, and so the fact of the, you know, that he still entertained, you know, sitting with me, you know, and, and reading this pilot that for two years, you know, no one in the industry was interested in developing or, or buying, um, so I think says a lot about Ryan. Well, it was very smart of him because I think there, there's definitely, th that's needed. And I think that's the other thing that stands out, that as authenticity of voice and that you bring as well to this show as you continue to kind of, um, you know, bring on board different writers and, and the cast. So that's, that's the next thing I do want to talk about, the Before cast. Before we go there, can Before I just say cast? something really quickly? Yeah. Which is, I think that the, what's important about Pose, I always say this, is that in many ways, I think the show, and specifically what Ryan 
as a producer has done with the show is created a, a case study for the industry um, on not only uh, equality, but also equity, you know, and true inclusion, because I think what Ryan realized is that he had a desire to tell this story, right? Which is why he was pursuing the rights to Paris is Burning, but also recognized like this isn't my story to tell, right? And so I think what he did is that he surrounded himself with a bunch of people whose story it was to aid in telling the story. But beyond that, it wasn't just, it wasn't tokenization, right? It wasn't just having us there for the sake of having us there. You know, Janet Mock has directed episodes of TV. I directed an episode this season. You know, all of that was at the behest of Ryan, who was like, listen, I think there's so much more that you have to offer. Um, and so it, it's incredible to be in a space where you know that you're being supported and that you're being pushed, you know, to, to do more, which is really great. Well, that's, I think, certainly connected to the casting then, you know, from, you know, casting so many transgender actresses and actors to be a part of this show. Um, you know, can you talk about the conversation? Because I'm sure that that was a conversation as he spoke with the executives and said, you know, this does have to be authentic. We're not just going to, um, you know, cast anyone and, and say, well, well, we'll, you know, the character's written, that's fine. You want to create space for these actors to be in the, the show. You know, I think what's really important, this is something just recently that I landed on, but I've been, I've made sure to talk about it when I'm in, in public spaces, which is really, really, really important for you to have social capital um, and then to use it smartly. Um, trust is critically important when it comes to the relationship between you as a content creator and whatever studio or network that you're working with. And so I say that to say that when I was pitching Pose, one of the gotcha questions that I would get from executives was, so tell me, who's supposed to play these characters? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and my response was always very defiantly, I don't know because I haven't met them yet. And you can imagine how that went over. You know? um, and so Ryan was the first person when we met to talk about collaborating on, on Pose the per first person who, when I brought it up, I said, well, in your mind, who would be playing these characters? He was like, oh, I don't know. He's like, I guess we would have to go out there and, and find untapped talent. And I knew from that answer that he was the right person to collaborate with because up until that point, most people were like, I, you know, good luck finding, you know, trans people to play these roles as if there aren't trans people on the world who are acting. So we were fortunate in that we were working with Alexa Fogel, who's our casting director, um, who um, most recently she, was, she cast Ozark and Atlanta, but if we go back to the earlier parts of her career, she also cast The Wire. Um, and if you're familiar with The Wire, which aired on HBO, that's another show that casts mostly unknowns. Um, and so what was great about working with Alexa was that, you know, there just, there was, there was never any resistance. It's funny, whenever this question about casting comes up, I think people expect for me to say, oh, it was so difficult, it was really hard, and people were like, I don't know, I'm not so sure, and it's like, there really wasn't any of that. Like, once Ryan came on board as a producer, and once FX came on board as our network, you know, again, there was a lot of trust that the network had in Ryan. So I think had I been working with FX on my own, I might have, have hit some roadblocks, but because I had, you know, that, you know, 100 or 1,000 pound gorilla behind me, AKA Ryan Murphy, they were like, yeah, go with God. Like, we, we trust you, um, which was really fantastic. And so what Alexa did is that she went out into the community. So she actually went to, with her team, to the balls in New York and she spoke to folks and she found out like who within this community um, is a performer and has a desire to be on screen and, and or has already been doing the work. Like in the case of, of MJ Rodriguez who plays Blanca, like MJ is someone who, you know, as a little girl, like she was involved in all kinds of, you know, theater camps and, you know, she's been performing forever. She just had never been given the opportunity because she's Afro-Latina and because she is a trans woman. 
you know? And so, and then suddenly the show comes along and now she can show people exactly how talented she is. Amazing. And you said she's at the Pasadena Playhouse right now? And she's right currently now? in the currently? Pasadena Playhouse starring as Audrey. <laughs> Amazing. A cis woman uh, in Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. That's and fantastic. she's fabulous. Like, you must go because her voice is just heavenly. That's fantastic. Um, and of course, um, you know, this, this, with this past season and the Emmy Award for, um, for Billy Porter, um, that, can you talk about, uh, I guess, the, the, the spirit, the energy that that's brought into the writer's room? And no, because we're not back yet. No. <laughs> um, we'll start season three, November 1st, um, or the writer's room on November 1st. <laughs> I'm glad you all are excited about it. I'm like, oh, more story. Um, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. Um, but I'm super excited about it. But no, I mean, the Emmy win was fantastic. It was so... Um, just what a magical moment, you know, to see our show, this, like, little show that could, if you will. You know, it. it <clears throat> in the moment when his name was called... And obviously there was so much surrounding the win because it's, you know, he's the first openly gay black man to ever win in that category. And beyond his being gay, I mean, if we just are looking at just black men who have won in the drama series race at all, it's like, what, yeah. he's the third, I, I believe? It's a very small list, <clears throat> you know, yeah. it's like, that's it. So, um, you know, so there, there was a lot that I was feeling in that moment you know I obviously it's like the rush of the long journey of the idea gestating and then putting it on the page and then you know the I guess comparatively speaking to some other folks who have been in this business for a really long time I always say the long two and a half years but in reality it's you know it's it was two and a half years and I, you know I think there are plenty of people here who probably were like I'd wait two and a half years to have my content get made um but in the moment, it felt, you know, it was an, a long, arduous road. But those were the things I was thinking about in the moment when he went up on that stage. It was like, gosh, whoever would have guessed that we would have gone from there to here, you know? Well, I think, you know, what it's, it's two and a half years for you, but I think there's a connecting, there's a line that connects to all of those young black men or, you know, who wanted to be in that position, haven't had those roles or that ability, and time goes by, and then you can't act anymore, your career's out, or you move on to other things. And so I think it's always really important to think about how inspiring as well those moments are. You know, whether it was yeah. 10 years or two and a half years, it's it's a great moment in that timeline, and, and then hopefully, leads to more roles and more opportunities. Well, just to, to de-center myself for a moment, I mean, I think the other thing that was really probably the, the best part of Billy's win and um, certainly was is, is the place where I'm, I get the most emotional when I think about the importance of his win. It's just I think about all of the young gay and trans folks, but I think more specifically like young gay black men who see Billy going up on that stage in his full authentic self, receiving this beautiful honor um, and how important it is to have that representation. You know, that somewhere out in the world, there has to be some young man who is also wrestling with his identity and dealing with tons of internalized homophobia and how important it is to have someone like Billy be the model for for success and for greatness. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, and I say this not being self-congratulatory, you know, I think that's what I'm most proud about when it comes to the show and, and what I'm, um, what I really want the show to represent for all young queer and trans people is just, you know, like your life can absolutely be a success. Like don't listen to the rhetoric, you know, whether it's at home or whether it's, you know, our current administration, you know, like you absolutely have the right to exist and, and to do that unapologetically. 
Well, there's kind of a great, in a way, parallel to the community that's created and, you know, the the reward system that's created, the awards within the within the house ball community, you know, and it's it be, it's a place where you can win an award and where you can be on top and you can compete and be rewarded and honored and loved and then to see that then translate to a real award and, you know, and, you know, in the... You know, outside of the TV world, um, you know, by the Television Academy, I think that's really uh, extraordinary. So, you know, I do want to ask um, a lot about how, sort of, in terms of storytelling as well, there there was that real, and in a great way, shift, tonal shift. The first season very much about community and the characters. Season two still that, but then also a lot about the history of AIDS, the history, this, the history of how communities were changing people were dying and there's it's it's a much more sad season um a darker season and yes so can you talk about how it was important to you to, to show that um within you know there's certainly a tragedy and, and loss in season one but season two it, in a completely different way yeah i mean we it's interesting because I've, I've read some think pieces about the show and and choices that we've made narratively. And I think <clears throat> the first season, there was a lot of, I'm hesitant to use the word fear, but you know, I can't think of something better at the moment. So let's just say there was a lot of fear around um, betraying our audience. Because I think, again, to go back to the conversation we were having about around trans lives and representation in cinema, I think that, um, you know, people of color, maybe more specifically black and, and Latin people, you know, it's, we're the, we're the help, you know, or we're the thug, or, you know, and it was just, you know, we're the dealer, we're the fill in the blank. And so we obviously were wanting to push past that narrative with the show. Um, but I think in wanting to lean into um, creating a show that had a lot of heart and a show that is positive, I think in some ways there was some criticism around the show feeling a little like Disney. Yeah. You know, like it was all a little too clean. It was all a little too perfect. Um, and so when we went back into the room for season two, the conversation that we had was around what are the very real issues that these communities are facing because, you know, obviously in the first season, we kind of sort of leaned into HIV. Yeah. You know, like we, we see Blanca diagnosed within the first 10 minutes of the pilot, but then we never really go back to that conversation at all throughout the remainder of the season, you know? And so I've had so many people after the first season aired ask me about that. Like, so what happened? Like, wh how was it that she was diagnosed and then you never talked about it again? So I think going into the room for the second season, the conversation that we had as a writing staff was, you know, what are those salient issues that the community is facing that we need to address? And then how can we then create um, a thread that connects what was happening to these folks in New York City in 1990 to the very real issues that are salient and that are, are relevant and current today, um, which is one of the reasons why, spoiler alert for those of you who haven't watched season two, I apologize, but it's one of the reasons why we chose to kill one of the characters off this season, you know, so it was, it was difficult for us to make that choice, um, and we knew that there would be a lot of critique around making it, um, you know, but we also currently are living, uh, you know, in a country where the life expectancy for black trans women is 35 years old. You know, so how can we have a, a show that is centering black trans women and not have a conversation around the violence, you know, that they are facing daily? Um, so, you know, it's, it's tough, but that's, you know, that, that's really, those are the conversations that, that we're having and those are the things that we're wrestling in our room. And so I think the, that's why we saw a darker, or the audience saw a darker season two. You know, it wasn't, I don't know that we were necessarily saying we want the season to be darker. I think it was just that we felt it was important for us to lean into the truth. You know, and the reality is that, you know, 
despite all the love and, and the community that exists with ballroom, outside of ballroom, New York was a very bleak and it was a, it was a tough city to live in. Um, and so we felt an immense responsibility to, to sharing that story. Well, I, you know, I think you've done really an incredible job, and it, and it's very it's very inspiring because I think that, you know, you you look at stories when you're you're growing up if you're a person of color, and, and you know, as you said earlier, there aren't a lot of stories or characters that you see outside of some of the stereotypes, and to take that and to find a story a root in something that um, is both entertaining, but then to bring the truth into that story and to expose um, a community that you know, as you were saying sometimes is a block away, but you don't have access to if you don't know about and not everyone is talking about. I think um, you've done a remarkable job, as I said, of just bringing that world to life and uh, inspiring others. So I want to thank you for coming today thank to you. help us launch this Thanks. the new wave. And um, you know, I hope I look for. I mean, I hope there's more content coming, more different shows, new shows, perhaps film, perhaps <laughs> <laughs> in the future. Anything that you can talk about this evening? No. <laughs> No, I'm sure there's someone from FX here that's just, no, I cannot. Oh, oh so on FX. <laughs> you know, like, ooh, I gave, oh, spoiler, I gave a spoiler, yeah, yeah, yeah. It may or may not be for FX. <laughs> oh, no, so um, congratulations on, yeah, on, on creating a show that is, has led to such a historic and remarkable um, Emmy win, and, and I can't wait to see season three.